And this is new books for the end of summer, spring and summer, I guess. I haven't done a video for a while, uh, 2015. Uh, this is medicine, got a couple, just two medicine books, science and psychology books. So I'll start with this one, History of Medicine. History of Medicine by um, Jacqueline Duffin. I have been interested in medicine lately. I'm actually reading right now um, about halfway through a book called Complications, and it's about it's it's uh, written by a surgeon. I would say it is quite easy to read. I was hoping it'd be a little more technical about what exactly is done in surgery and what are the complications. But so far, the book has really been about um, the ethics of surgery, and that's not what I was interested in. I was really interested in like pra surgical surgical practices and what can go wrong and what's done to fix certain things. I was kind of hoping it would get into that, but it's not as detailed as I want, as I was hoping. But anyways, um, I have been interested in medicine, and um, a history of medicine should be fantastic. I, I'm hoping this book um, will also talk about, it looks like it's fairly recent. It's got some highlighting in it, which is kind of annoying, but oh well. Uh, this is 1999, uh, reprinted uh, 2000, this one, but this is 1999, I guess, oh, how up to date it is. I'm hoping it, it gets into some of the early apothecarian techniques, especially the whole thing about blood, um, yellow and black bile, and phlegm, and how um, what doctors used to do is if they have something wrong with you, they it would either be one of those four things that would be out of balance. And I don't quite remember, I don't quite know what it is if you were having a fever, um, then you were hot, right? And they would make you bleed. I'm not quite sure if that's right. But if you were freezing, then there was something else off. So, I don't know, black bile was off or I don't know. So, um, I'm hoping they talk about that. And there's all kinds of other techniques. Um, I recently finished, um, oh, well, uh, the Genghis Khan book I had read a long time ago. Or not, not that long ago, but maybe six months ago. I just finished a review for it today. Um, making the videos for it and one thing it mentioned is what's called a pulse diagnosis was popular in um, China and it was brought over to the Middle East interestingly enough um, the Middle Eastern Muslims mostly right did not like the acupuncture uh, from China from, uh, medicine but they did like uh, because there's too much touching of the body but they did like the pulse diagnosis because then a male doctor, and I don't think there were any female doctors, so it was always a male doctor, could actually then diagnose a, a woman who was sick in some way because she didn't. Ha he, the doctor didn't have to look at her body or anything because to Muslims that's can't do that unless you're a family member, I guess. Um, so a non-familial doctor could just touch the woman's wrist and diagnose her with a pulse. I guess the speed of the pulse or, or whatever it is, um, they can do that. And so that the, the Middle East did like that. So they did take that from China through Genghis Khan's uh, lineage. Um, so that was that's neat. So I'm hoping that kind of stuff's in here. Some of the early um, medical practices, I'm sure Hippocrates will be the beginning. And Galen and Harvey, circulation of the blood, stuff like that. So I'm really happy to get into that uh, someday. Here's another medical book, which I have read. Um, first Aid Reference Guide. This is produced by St. John's Ambulance, uh, which is probably a well-known, um, I don't know what you call them, uh, they, they, do, they do first aid training. And this book is basically um, what you purchase if you were to do a first aid course, which I haven't done. But I suppose this is uh, an, a, the non-licensed equivalent would be to read this book, which I have. And for some reason, I was talking to a friend of mine, and they thought it was weird that I would read a first aid book for fun, but I did. And it's actually very readable. It's very organized. There's all kinds of pictures and and um, nice diagrams like this. And there's tons of techniques for um, making bandages. And there's there's also this um, this bandage that, that you put the person's arm against their body, and you bandage them like this, and that's called a St. John's Ambulance Bandage or something like that. I guess they have a unique copyright on that. But there's all kinds of um, techniques on how to bandage. There's, of course, the, the standard what to do. Um, if you arri arrive on an accident scene or a trauma scene, you've got multiple um, uh, people that are, that are hurt, some guy in a car that's hurt, some guy that went out through the windshield that's mangled on the ground somewhere, what you're supposed to do. And so it's got all that kind of stuff, which is just fantastic. I think that's great. I have never actually 
in real life seen someone collapse on the floor or um, shake in a seizure or get hit by a car or any I've never seen that kind of stuff or broken bones and um, I haven't seen that I've, obviously I've seen people stra uh, sprain their ankles and stuff but I've never seen anything horrific which I guess is probably a good thing but um, it was a very it was a great read and I feel minimally prepared if something were to happen but if I were to be more serious about it I would probably take the course pay the hundred bucks or whatever it is and then have a little kit in my car or something um, for that but um, anyways it is what's called a first responder guide so you're at, essentially trying to keep the person stable or at least reduce the symptoms until the ambulance arrives until the paramedics arrive and it, it's no joking matter the, the first responders are the most important uh, the first something like the first um, the first few minutes obviously count quite a bit depending on what, what the person's problem is and something like the first hour is the most important. Uh, after that, the stati uh, statistics of survival keep going down and down. So first responders are definitely important. Paramedics can't be everywhere. Police can't be everywhere. That's often the argument used for people to carry firearms because uh, when seconds count, cops are minutes away, right? Well, it's nice to have first responders around because, they're, if, if for example, if everyone had to take a first aid course at a high school, and at least everyone had a minimal degree of competence when it deals with first aid measures, there would be a lot of lives saved. So, anyways, I thought that was that was a great uh, guide, and I, I learned a lot from it. So I'm getting into some science. I have here, and it's probably unreadable, but this is an old book by Isaac Newton, and it's called Newton's Principia. And I found this in a discard, and I actually know who's who it was. Here, I'll show you the front. Hopefully that comes through. Sir Isaac Newton's Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy and His System of the World. This is translated by into English by somebody in 1729, and then it was revised and edited and stuff by this other this guy here. Um, 1960 it was published so wow this is amazing although I don't know when I'll get to read it but I, I was just transfixed and I had to pick it up because this is a very important text in physics unfortunately I don't think anybody in physics studies it anymore uh, probably why it was discarded uh, but there's tons of mathematics in here like look at this stuff like that is like that's just crazy and I don't know how much of that I'm going to be able to absorb. Um, but anyways, I probably will flip through it someday, as I am right now, and um, get what I can out of it. But there is tons and tons of geometry and stuff in here, wave patterns. and But this is where a lot of this began with Newton. And I it's very unfortunate that scientists don't study their history anymore because I think they can learn a lot from the giants of the field. But it, it just seems like today... So many people in um, in universities are so transfixed on the future; they don't realize that you can learn a lot from the from the past. If Isaac Newton was alive today, do you think do you think he would be useless, or do you think he would be able to make some contributions? That's the I think there may be some kind of arrogance to do with scientists today. Is that they 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 might even say that Isaac Newton would make no contributions today. Um, just because he was a great mind doesn't mean that he could possibly aid us today. I guess there's this idea that even in philosophy, that any person with a PhD in philosophy today is the equivalent of an Aristotle, in the sense that if we teleported a PhD in philosophy, or you can take anything, physics or biology, or whatever you want, and put them in the ancient Greek world, would they be able to make the contributions that Aristotle made and Plato made like the question is whether were Plato and Aristotle just IQ 130 minds of today in a sense then we have tons of those people walking around today or were they something that was true at a level of genius something that would not be matched today that's the interesting question okay 
another nice one that I, um, the Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene. I actually probably got through a quarter of it just reading it on an ebook. But of course, ebooks, you know, you, I don't know. I don't really have a lot of discipline for ebooks. Um, but this, I think, is his most well known book, um, The Selfish Gene. Like, there's certainly, I guess it depends on what you're interested in. There's certainly, um, uh, what's that one called? The God Delusion. And um, The Greatest Show on Earth is a recent one. Um, and, um, but. The Selfish Gene, I think, is probably D Dawkins' most famous, in at least in the biology sector, because he he talk he's talking about how genes kind of keep their hegemony in in our biology by um, making sure that they're along for the ride in various activities through our progeny. Um, so, and I, I recall. Um, Dawkins in some interviews saying that he didn't quite like calling it the selfish gene, um, but he had to. I guess the publishers have some influence on the titles, so they want to sell books, right? Here's one I just recently picked up, just the other, maybe a few days ago, on mathematics. Um, this is by um, Time Life Books, and you may know Time Life Books. They produce some pretty good stuff for the public. Uh, I do have another Time Life Books, although it's a big hardcover, on the I think it's called the First Metal Smiths, and it's just fantastic. And so is this. There's all kinds of really nice art in the book. On some, so this will be the era of mathematics, is where a lot of it began, and well, ancient Greek, of course, is where it began. But um, certainly, when during the Dark Ages, when the Christians were basically doing almost nothing, um, the Arab world, the Middle East, kind of um, kept society, kept the world going in progress. Uh, but there's all kinds of just fantastic uh, pictures in here um, and all kinds of stuff on mathematics. Look at, there's all kinds of dice and stuff. So I think that that should be fantastic. And I don't really have a book on general, uh, general mathematics, so that should do it. Here's an interesting one, which I would be curious to get to. The God Particle. If the universe is the answer, what is the question? This is by Leon Lederman. I thought this should be really neat, a book in physics, because I think it talks about they they they're trying to like they, they keep producing the atom down to quarks and well pro, or the atom down to protons and electrons and neutrons and then you can break those down into quarks and then I don't know they keep going and yeah the book is, it says here on the flaps that the book is is this guy is um is done research on on what atoms are and what their parts are and he's advocating for the build, the building of a better machine to figure out a bigger machine to accelerate particles and to bang them together and make them explode and study what the parts are and eventually he thinks he's going to get to a, a god particle I think he means a final particle that can't actually can't be broken because the atom can be broken the atom has been has been destroyed and we have found subatomic particles, right? So the atom, it, like because the atom is a Greek word, the atom is meaning that it cannot be cut. I guess a means it cannot, and tome means cut. Maybe I don't know. But that was that came out of ancient Greece. Um, but we can break the atom now. It's just that how far can we break it? So I think this guy's this book is exploring how far we've broken it, and then. In the future, we're going to build a bigger machine to break it even more. So, Okay, a bunch of books in psychology um, that are kind of educational psychology. A lot of books, a few books on PHA I picked up. Um, my library, I discarded them. So here's one book. It just has a library cover, so I'm not going to bother showing it. But it's called The Impact of Piagetic in Theory on Education, Philosophy, Psychiatry, and Psychology. Um, I am interested in PHA, but... I may be interested in the sense of wanting to um, maybe call into question his his importance and hegemony, because I think that while Piaget did a lot of the studying of children and the a lot of um, the like, I guess clinical trials sort of some of his studies were on his own kids like. Some of his experimentation was not really up to the standards of science today, but I think a lot of his ideas are actually not new. And I think Montessori, who was a contemporary, actually, uh, actually Montessori was older, 
Um, I think actually she um, originated some of the ideas that are now considered Piagetian. So I don't know what I'm going to do it, but someday I'm going to cut down Piaget a bit to size because I think he has a, a greater um, hegemony or, or believed importance than he should. Uh, here's another one, Piaget, The Man and His Ideas uh, by Richard Evans. So just another one on Piaget that I'm going to use in my, uh, in my uh, warfare. Yes. Another one, I think, uh, Piaget's Theory, a Psychological Critique. And this one, I think, is not on Piaget. Moral Stages, a Current Formulation and a Response to Critics. So this will be about Kohlberg. Kohlberg's moral stages. Again, I I'm not a fan of Kohlberg because I think he he um, he disabuse he we need to disabuse him of being a philosopher. I don't think he can talk about moral stages. Like I just his presumptions are insane. That's kind of the things he says about um, the last stage of moral. He says that the being selfish is some of the the primor some of the like first stages. And then eventually, when a child becomes altruistic, now they're the, now they're a better human being. Now that's the last stage of moral development. But that's stupid because obviously we have to decide what what are proper moral stages. He's not measuring these things; he's judging these things, and that's wrong. So that's a stupid thing. So that'll be something I'll have to deal with later. Here's another book that I'd, I guess it's um, I don't have anything on, and I thought I might read to see what's what it's about. It's a book on child abuse. Um, child sexual abuse, listening, hearing, and validating the experiences of children. Um, it's not really a clinical book. Um, I don't know if it may be not the best book to read to start with. It may be kind of biased. I did kind of flip through it, and it did. It does. It was saying a lot of that. Don't worry about the truth. Just always validate what the child's saying, and like, uh, and you know. Maybe that's the best case in the situation, but that may not be the best case in a, in a courtroom, for example. You want the truth to rule, not a person's feelings. But I thought maybe this would be a good place to start because I don't have any anything on it. And there's all kinds of children's drawings and stuff in here. So anyways, I thought I don't have anything on it, so I thought I would um, see what's in here. Okay, so that's it for psychology and medicine, and now I will do history.